Hey, everybody, welcome back. Gavin, the OG original Grognard, sitting down at the table? Yes. <laughs> I keep wanting to throw in uh, adjectives like the Batmobile and, the, you know, the grognard mobile and the Grognard table and the Grognard shark repellent. And I shouldn't do that. That's just dumb and stupid. I'm not Batman. I sometimes wish I were Batman, but then I'd have to go kill my parents. That's probably a bad thing. Anyways, so, Star Trekking across the universe on the Starship Enterprise under Captain Kirk. Oh, no, no. This isn't Star Trek. This is Star Explorer. Yes, Star Explorer 1982 Fantasy Unlimited Games. And yeah, I mean, it, 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 it. Jesus, it just looks like Star Trek. I mean, honestly. I mean, that looks like Kirk, and here's the, the Federation uniforms, and the, you know, kind of looks like the Enterprise. Yeah. So, yeah. Star Trekking across the universe. For those of you who don't know that song, it's an old classic. Dr. Demento used to play it on his show a lot. If you don't know who Dr. Demento is, you're not as old as I am. Uh, <laughs> he's basically the guy who gave Weird Al his start. Uh Go check it out on YouTube. Good stuff. So, Star Explorer. Uh, take a look right here. Dedicated to Paul Ketterman and the Next Generation. 1982. Yeah. A lot of, uh, of course, you know, Next Generation, Star Trek Next Generation hadn't been released by that point, but, you know, it's, 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 it's good to, it's good to mock and make fun of it. Uh, kind of going over the game. Pain in the ass to get these counters out. Not real good die cutting. Um, yeah. Not real happy with how these counters turned out. Clipped them. But even still, on the tops and bottom of the counters, they've got these annoying uh, chads. And I'm tempted to go through with uh, a pair of clippers and take and, and snip them off. And also really, really horrid off-center printing of the game. I don't know if it's just this copy. Uh, I don't own or I've never owned a lot of Fantasy Unlimited games. Or Fantasy Games Unlimited games. So I can't say if this is a indicative of what their, their die cutting and their counters used to be. But yeah, it was, it was a gigantic pain in the ass. I almost broke out my... Uh, exacto blade to start helping me cut the stupid things out nice small map not even a 21 by 32 so nice small compact most of the most of the map is taken up by this right here which is actually way too big for what it does we'll get to that in a little bit combat track up here <laughs> really really simplistic combat track we'll get to that Bunch of charts and tables, hard to see, small, tiny, tiny font, black on green. Yeah, just really, really hard. And then planetary display, uh, not really needed. Apologize for the glare. At least I don't think it's needed. A couple different uh, track sheets, keep track of your ship. Uh, engines, teleporter shields, beams, missiles, your different crews, fuel stores, ship class, vessel name. I think we can name it the Enterprise. No, can't name it the Enterprise. Uh, uh, Defiant. No, 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 no. Can't name it the Defiant. Serenity. No, 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 no. Can't name it Serenity. Uh, Orville. No, 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 no. no. Wilbur. Yeah, Wilbur. Okay, Wilbur hasn't been taken. Uh, <laughs> we might name the ship the Wilbur. Oh, Wilbur. Um, and then, uh, planet tracking log. Tracking your turns, the IDs, and the different missions that you're going to encounter on there. The game is billed as a four, up to a four-player game. However, like most games in the late 70s, early 80s that were billed this way, it really would have been more suited as a solitaire system. Now, granted, you know, they give you four different colors. Red, yellow, green, and I went with blue. Uh, just because I like blue. Blue is the color of death. So, um, you can't really interact with the other players in this game, no matter how many people are playing. Uh, you can't trade with them. You can't attack them. You can't do anything like that. It, it's it's kind of like also Source of the Nile from Avalon Hill. Great game. I love Source of the Nile. Build is like a six-player game. But you don't interact with the other players, so how can it really be a multiple-player game? I kind of get it. In the late 70s, early 80s, there wasn't really a lot of solitaire systems. There really, really wasn't. And they didn't want to try to... Try, I don't think they wanted to market games 
as a solitaire system because that re the, it, it, at the time it kind of reduced the potential flow because back in those days we didn't have things called computers um so we didn't have a way to go online find opponents stuff like that and and we didn't have computer games per se and computer games really did kill the wargaming industry in the late 80s early 90s i did a podcast on it once i should break out those podcasts and convert them from podcasts and throw them up on YouTube. But so a lot of these games that they made in the 70s and 80s, which should have been billed as solitaire games, they just jam-packed a bunch of extra counters in there and said, all right, it's a multiplayer game, but you really don't interact with each other. So what's the point exactly? I mean, what are some other games that kind of fall into, into, into that niche? Oh, I'm trying to take a look at my copies, but there were a bunch of them. That, uh, Conquistador? Conquistador kind of had a little bit of uh, of interplayer action. I mean, you could attack the other person's ports and stuff, but for the most part, you just really didn't. Um, and you can't even call it a co-op Euro game because you're not cooperating to get to somewhere like Pandemic or Firefighter or you know you know any of the other the other co-op games. It, it really was. A, 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 mul a solitaire multiple player game. I guess that's the best way to put it. But it, it was something that they did a lot of. And I, 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 one of these days I'm going to sit down and actually just do a complete topic, a uh, complete cast on this phenomenon of games that were billed as multiplayer, but when you got down to it, really weren't multiplayer. Anyways, so what's the game? Go out, explore. Meet strange new people, visit strange new worlds, run into encounters and hazards, throw a bunch of different crew t crews at them, and try to resolve the issue and try to get as many victory points as you can in 20 turns. You go over 20 turns, you start losing victory points. So, how do you go about doing that? Well, since this is a solitaire game mainly... Uh, you start off with four planets. Well, you only have four planets. It, the, the, the rules say if you, if you want to play with five or six people, you can just add in one planet for five, one more planet for five players, two more planets for six players, and for each extra player over four, just add another five turns on. So you got four planets. You put the planets out on this, and <laughs> really, this didn't need to be this big. Why? Okay, so. You have to place the planets. These are the four planets you're going to go exploring. And one planet, the first one planet, you know exactly what type of crisis you're going to run into. Sort of. The other three planets, you have no idea what the crisis is going to be till you get there. So what do you do? How do you set it all up? Make sure I got this right. Okay, roll for each, roll for the location of each planet. How do you do that? Well, it says you do the distance first and then figure out which direction on the wheel arrow that you roll on. Personally, I think you should probably decide the direction first. So, you know, simple D6. Let's figure the first planet. One. All right, so that'll be off of, you can kind of see, around the space station, your space station in the center, you've got, you know, six directions that you can go off of. So one, so it'll be direction one. So the first planet will be that direction. Okay, and we're reading off of the sequence of play. Uh, row, okay, distance 1d6 plus five. So, all right, well, that seems easy enough. Two plus five is seven. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All right, there's our first planet. Now, the four, the three other planets are figured out the same way. One, two, three, four, five, so roll six and roll a direction. However, at that point, it just becomes a game where you basically are just going down six lines. Now, you can move in any direction you want to. So, yeah, technically, if, like, there was a planet right here and a planet right here, you could cut across that way. But really, when you look at it, it kind of makes it... I don't know. I, I I don't like the fact that that it only puts the planets in the six six directional location. So let's go for the rest of them. So the second planet, five, uh, two plus five is seven. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So that one's there. Third planet, 
Uh, section uh, odd down five as well. Distance six. What happens if it goes off? It doesn't say anything about what happens if it goes off. You would think planet locations. Huh. Location for, the, for each planet is determined as followed. For the distance of each planet from the central home star base determined by rolling D6 and adding 5 to the results of to determine the number of hexes the planet is from the star base. So that's 11 hexes, 7, 8, 9, 10, oh, I guess it is straight out is maximum of 11. And final planet, hex row 6, distance 7. <laughs> okay, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, seven. Okay, so that is basically our universe. So, again, like I was saying, you got these big open spaces in between that, you know, you're not really doing anything with. So, I thought, why not we, why don't we mix it up a little bit. And, oh, dropping dice all over the place. And, of course, I don't have a D20 handy. Oh, let me dig out a D20 real quick. From the old bag of dice. This bag that I've owned since freaking high school. Literally, I, I bought this thing when I was in high school. Where's a good D20? See, we got some of my original D&D dice in there. And that is scary. There's some old school <laughs> polyhedrons. Uh, all right, we'll use this. This is a good D20 to use for now. So <laughs> I'm going to mix it up a little bit. So we're going to roll a D6 to shift the planet's orbit left or right, so even odd, or one, two, three, four, five, six, it doesn't matter, even odd. So odd, and we're gonna roll a d20 for that many hexes. So 19 hexes, so we're gonna one, two, three, four, five, six, and as soon as we hit another range band, seven, eight, nine, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 18, 19, well, that didn't work out too well. Oh, well, we're gonna keep it that way anyways. So this planet, even odd, two, so that way, eight hexes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so it's a little bit off center, then that's fine. We want we want it we want a little bit of variety in it. Uh this planet, even odd, even uh fourteen hexes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. So again. Normally, you'd have all this open this this open space that's not got much in it. Now we're now we're breaking it up a little bit. I have no idea if this is going to have an effect on how how long it's going to take me to get anywhere. So three even odd. So it's, or planet's going to rotate orbit that way. Nineteen. Jeez, need to get rid of this dice. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, six, eighteen. 19. Did that work out? I don't think that worked out. Ah, well. What we want to do is just break up how the planets are formed. And so now we got a, we got a more varied approach in, in the planet placement. So what is what happens next? Now that we've got the planets established, and well, the thing you need to do beforehand is set up your ship. Now you get... A certain number of baseline uh, stats for engines, transporter shields, and crew members, and all that good stuff. However, you do get a number of points that you can fiddle with and play with to kind of tweak how many crew members you get. If you want extra shields, you want extra engines, you want extra fuel stores, all that good stuff. I went with the base stock ship that comes right out of the book because I didn't want to mess with making my own ship. So we've got seven engines, eight teleporters, so seven engines. Engines determine how far you can move each turn. Of course, the more you move, the more energy it's going to cost you. And the higher you go, the more energy it's going to cost. Uh, teleporter. This is how many crew members you can you can have, or how many teams you can have operating on a planet at once. Now, a planet will have... Usually, you roll for three encounters, although not every encounter is going to require you to send teams down. So... And you got to resolve these by rolling dice, and we'll get into that in a little bit. But 
your teleporters limit you to the number of teams that you can put down to the planet. The more teleporters you have, the more teams you can put down, the quicker you can get the stupid missions done, and the quicker you can get the game finished. Uh, shields, uh, well, that should be relatively self-explanatory. Shields, you put energy into shields, it protects damage in combat, and there's a couple other things. Beams is, well... Your, your beam weapons, how many beams you fire in combat. Missiles, again, missiles do a lot more damage, but they're very, very limited in range. Then you've got your crew, navigation, fire control, damage control, geology, fuel engineer, botany, animal psychology, sentient contact, medical, and military. Now, military is kind of an oddball. It can be used for kind of anything. It doesn't have a specialty, but can be used to assist all the other jobs, basically. And this is basically how many crew members you have. So, if you have issues on planets, these are the teams you send down, limited by how many ta transporter teleporters you have. So I've got eight teleporters, so I can send eight crew down, mix and match. But, you know, I'm limited to one navigation, one fire control, one DC, one ge or two geology, two fuel engineers, two botany, three animal psychology, three sen sending sentient contact, three, nine medi or, yeah, three medical, seven military. Now, you can change that loadout out if you go back to your star base, but we won't get into that right now. And then fuel stores. It can have up to 100, but you can purchase more. But we just went with a base stock 100. No, I'm not going to be marking on this. I'm just going to be marking fuel off uh, on another page as I burn through it. And then the other sheet that you actually do mark on a lot. You've got four planets. I don't know why they give you planet ID because none of the planets are identified in any way, shape, or form. So how are you supposed to ID the planet? I suppose you could write down yellow with blue stripies and blue with, well, that's he's wrote it's blue with white and blue with white, but anyways, we're just going to go as easy as one, two, three, four, top to bottom. That's how we're going to mark it. One, two, three, four. And then you have the environment, which you don't know of until you get there. And then the three encounters for each planet you mark down and that'll give you an, that will, that will tell you what crews you need to send down to resolve the issues on the planet. And then you've got your speed, which I think this is totally, totally, hugely, hugely more large than it has to be. So you've got up to 30 turns. I mean, 20 turns, if you go over 20 turns, you start losing victory points. So 20 is, is the magical number that you're looking to try to fin finish the exploration of the four planets by. But you mark down Speed, I don't even know why they have the destination on there. I mean, you can write the destination planet, but, you know, if, if you're playing, you, you know where you're moving. And how many victory points you cure per turn. There's a bunch of ways, a bunch of different ways to get victory points. This entire section is just larger than it needs to be. It could have cut this down in half for, for speed and all that other good stuff. So, that's kind of the basic layout of the game. Uh, not really going to get into starting playing the game. I just kind of wanted to give a brief overview and some, some thoughts on the game real quick. Um, so, you start out from the star base. Decide how, mu how, many, how, much, how many engines you're going to fire up or, or how fast you want to go. And that's limited by your engine space or how many engines you have, and that'll determine how much fuel you spend, or energy. So I've got what? I've got seven engines. So I can go maximum of speed seven, which will be seven hexes of movement, but it'll cost me 13 fuel out of the 100. Now you can refuel, go back, go back to the main station. So you do that, you move to whatever planet you want to go to, you roll a dice in each hex that you enter. I think it's a six-sided dice, and on the six, there's a space encounter. On the space encounter, roll on the space encounter chart, do the space encounter. Could be something good, could be something bad. You could end up combat with pirates. You could end up combat with the with the not Klingons. <laughs> and I call them the not Klingons because they are totally not Klingon-looking ships. Yeah, totally not Klingon-looking ships at all. You know, totally not Klingon looking at all. But you can get into fights with them, and then you go through combat, and there's pirates that you can get in combat with. And there's space hazards like asteroid fields and space webs and a whole bunch of different things that you can do. And you got to roll dice to try to, to try to resolve the issue. You could take damage if you're going too fast through an asteroid field or, you know, what have you. You get to the planet. Roll what kind of planet it is. For some reason... 
you don't know what all these planet uh, planets are like. You know, they, you know that these are mostly Earth-like planets. You just don't know if they're like grasslands, forest, jungle, desert, swamp, mountain, glacier, radiated, volcanic, aquatic. You don't know that till you get there. Why? I don't know. But you roll, when you get to the planet, you have the planetary encounter. And so, say you roll, well, actually, there's a, where is it? I don't even think it's on here. But you roll to see what type of planet. Yeah, it is the, the chart. Oh, there it is. The environmental table right there. Let's see if we can zoom in through the glare. And being able to see it with the crappy small font with the black on. No, you're not going to be able to see it. Nah, all right, balls. All right, so you roll what type of planet it is. Then you see what type of encounters you could possibly get there. And again, I apologize for the glare. So say it's a grassland. You roll three times on a 20-sided dice. And you find out, you know, if it's what this will determine what your events are. Geological plant, herbivore, carnivore, sentient, disease, or disaster. You do that three times. That tells you what all the missions are. Oh, well, you look at it first to see potentially what the, what the missions are. Then you decide which teams you want to send down. So you don't even know what the encounters are until you send your people down, except for the very first mission. You, you The very first planet and the very first mission, you actually do roll on. There is this table here, and you do actually know what that is. You know, what kind of, if it's a disturbance or an investigation, it tells you exactly what. So the only mission you know what you're going to be doing is the very first one on the very first planet. The other 11 encounters that you run into, you have no idea what they are. Get to the planet, roll for the planet type, Look at what possible encounters there are going to be, and then decide which crews you're going to send down. Basically, then you roll a bunch of other charts to find out what the exact encounter is, and that'll tell you what you need uh, as a dice roll to pass. And it, get, it gets easier every turn, because the longer you spend on a project, the easier it becomes to figure it out. Um, and if, you, you know, if, you're, if you're doing a geological and you have a geology, a geology team there that gives you a bonus to your dice roll. Military can be filled out for anything, you know, whatever. Um, but then, then, so yeah, you basically roll 20-sided dice. I think for a lot, of, a lot of them, the first dice roll, the target number is a 15. So if you're going after a geological event and you've got two geolog geology teams with you, that gives you what plus four to your dice roll. I think it's I think it's either plus one or plus two per team. So say it's plus two. So you get a plus four to your dice roll. You roll if it's fifteen or better. You complete the mission. Yay! Woo! You don't complete the mission. You have to roll to see if there's any casualties, uh, because everybody's a red shirt. It seems <laughs> the casualties aren't that bad. It doesn't flat out kill you. Kill you. Um, it's a one in six chance of actually killing. Killing. Uh, the crew member, everything else, it just puts it, it just puts them out of order and for a number of turns. So, say you're doing a mission, say we're doing the geology mission, like I was just talking about, and we fail, we we fail the dice roll, and we get we get we roll again on another table because solitaire games always got to have lots of tables. Uh, and again, most games in the late seventies, early nineties had bunches of tables, anyways. See if there's a see if there's any casualties. If there are casualties, you roll it up. Oh, I'm going to have to lose one geology member. You roll another dice to see what the extent of the injury is. Uh, you know, like a one through five, it's uh, or they're just incapacitated for D6 turns. If it's a six, they're completely wiped out, and you remove them from your crew roster. And again, like I said, if you go back to your star base, you can restock on people. But that takes turns. And remember, you've got 20 turns to explore the four planets, the three missions on each planet. No, you don't have enough energy to make it all. You're going to have to go back to your base. So it's a time management game. What can you do in the amount of time you have so you don't run into turn 20 and start losing points? The concept is really, really simple. I mean, there's only a 16-page rule book. And most of it, and it's a tiny friggin' font, but a good chunk of it is charts and tables and really the rule book is set out and i, I do kind of like it because they go over specifically all right here's a geological encounter this is the process of going through it you know this is an animal encounter herbivore carnivore most of the encounters are exactly the same roll a couple dice see what the encounter is roll to see what your what your uh, what or look at what your target number is for how many turns you've been working on it so i like that there's a lot of repetition in the rule book because 
of all the different encounters, you know, there's what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different classes of count encounters. Seven of them, the mechanics are virtually identical. Just the numbers are a little bit off. But I like that they laid it out step by step for each encounter. It makes it easier. Makes the rule book, a little, rule book a little bit thicker, but once you realize that they repeat themselves seven times on how to do an encounter, the rule book isn't that thick. It's not really that hard of a game. I mean, the multiplayer in this comes to see who could do it the fastest, really. But by the same token, it slides in real easy as a good solitaire game, just like uh, Source of the Nile is a great solitaire game. Conquistador is a great solitaire game. I'm guessing Dark Stars from, uh, <laughs> I'm thinking of that because I'm looking right at it, uh, from Simulations Canada. Build as a multiplayer game, but again, you can't really interact with your other players, so it makes it a good solitaire game. There's one that I've wanted to get onto the table for a very, and <laughs> a lot of these are space games. Um, uh, Dark Trader? No, 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 not Dark, Dark Trader. I can't remember the name of it. It's a metagames concept, one of their later games. It's one of the little Ziploc, or not Ziploc, even though they didn't even, they weren't even Ziplocs. One of the little micro games that uh, metagame concepts did back in the day. It was basically a trading game. And you had, you know, kind of mostly a blank mat, and you rolled randomly for where the distance that different systems were, and you built your merchant ship and went around and, you know, tried to do trading and making money and running into encounters. Basically something like this, only with uh, merchant. Had a merchant. Had a pretty good uh, uh, economy. I mean, it had lots of charts in it. <laughs> again, we're talking late 70s, early 80s. Uh, but since it's a merchant game, again, a lot of dice rolling on different charts to see the different uh, resources, their prices. How, you know, it was a buying and selling game. I enjoy games like that. I tend to do really bad at them because I usually invest in the, the <laughs> like, yeah, they want these shiny flip-flop widgets on planet X. I know they want them, so I'll fill up my hole with them and get there. And no, they wanted Endurian wine. Well, balls. So, yeah, it gets a little bit of random number generator <laughs> in those merchant games. But I, st I still enjoy the merchant games. So this is basically, that's basically Star Explorer. Uh, running about a half hour. Like I said, I didn't want to get into gameplay. Oh, uh, let's go over combat real quick. Combat's real easy. Um, if you, you can either run into pirates or the, the not Klingons. And the ships are, you know, there's like eight different classes of ships between the two enemies that you can roll for to see what you're facing off against. And normally you'll start at range 10. And every every one is supposed to be 100,000 kilometers or 50,000 kilometers or something like that. Absolutely tiny, tiny distance in the, in the vastness of space. Unless you try to bribe them or negotiate and it failed, in which case you start off at rank 7. The, the, compu the, the computer, <laughs> the AI does the same thing every time. They will always advance one space towards you each turn and fire every weapon system they can. No shields, nothing like that. You, as the player, decides, all right, how much energy do I want to put into shields? What weapon systems do I want to fire? And it's real easy. Beam weapons and missile weapons, their tit number is basically based on whatever range you are. So if you're a range 6, not that you can see it because it's horrible type fonting. Beams, you need a 12 or less with beams, and missiles can't even hit. Missiles, you got to be at least range 5 to hit with missiles. Uh, beam weapons do like... D6 times 3, and missile weapons do D6 times 5 for each one that hits. Marks it off the hull. Uh, unless you've got sh put the energy into shields, and each shield takes off like 10 points of damage. Bad guys don't have shields. As soon as either side... Well, you as the player can try to, try to escape combat at any time. It's just how many turns... Do you go before? Because <laughs> if you, if you if you retreat too soon, you start losing victory points. Because yeah, right here. Uh, run after first round of combat, lose twenty victory points. Run after second round of combat, lose fifteen. Yada yada yada. Long, you know, as long as you can hold out to the fifth round of combat, uh, or if you run before any combat is fought, lose lose twenty five victory points. Um, so you, you usually want to try to hold out till turn five. Uh, and the enemies, well, that's for you running away. You have to run away, or at least attempt to run away, when you hit 75% of your hull damage, and so does the enemy player. Very rarely are you ever actually going to destroy something, because, like I said, once they hit 75%, they get a chance to start rolling to run away. Uh, 
But if you do win the combat and you get victory points, you destroy the enemy ship, you even have more victory points. So very simplistic, very basic. And really for the scale and what you're doing, it's perfectly fine. I mean, I, I have no problem with how this combat system works. Uh, although, you know, if you've got fire control, I think fire control gives you modifiers. Fire control crews give you modifiers to your dice roll when you're trying to shoot at them. Uh, and, you know, of course, navigation, if you run into space encounters like asteroid fields or, or energy barriers or stuff like that, that's where navigation comes in. Damage control, if your ship is damaged, you can try to repair it, and that's what your damage control teams are. And, of course, geology, if you're going against geology encounters. Fuel engineers, that's kind of the fourth encounter you can, you can run into. Uh, if you're low on fuel, you can, you can do a fourth mission on a planet to scavenge for, for fuel. Uh, and that's what the fuel engineers are for. Botany are, of course, for plant and cat based encounters. Animal physiology are for uh, carnivore and herbivore encounters. Sentient contact, really, that should be self self evident. Medical is uh, diseases, disasters, a couple other a couple other encounters, uh, and then military is just red shirts. <laughs> it's like, oh, I want to put two geology and two military. Well, why do you want to use military? Okay, here's how, here's why you want to use military. Like, all right, I gotta, I'm going to put two geology and two military work in this. Oh, look, uh, I lose a team. Uh, well, let's lose it off the military rather than the geology. Yeah, like I said, they're the red shirts. So they, they, they end up taking all the casualties. Uh, there is a campaign game that you can kind of do, play the game multiple times. The cap, you'll captain get experience and then you can put your, your, you can put your, you can put your experience points into the different, different, into the different skills and that'll give you bonus dice rolls. And really that's the down and dirty of it. I mean, not very graphically, wee it didn't need to be. It doesn't need to be. I mean, for what it's doing, like I said, my biggest complaint was the horrid, horridness of punching the counters and just this horrible, horrible font of black on dark green. Really, really hard for my old eyes to see. Not really an issue back in the day, you know, because, hey, these designers were in their 20s and 30s. Their eyesight, they didn't think about what their eyesight would be. And, you know, I'm pretty sure none of them even thought, you know, somebody would be playing their game 35, 40, no, this is 82, you know, close to 40 years later. So it is what it is. So yeah, that's it. That's kind of a brief overview of Star Explorer. Star trekking across the universe on the Starship Enterprise under Captain Kirk. Yeah, like I said, go check it out. It's <laughs> When you're 12 years old, the song is hilarious as fuck. When you're 50, eh, not so much. But like I said, the young me always appreciated it. Questions, comments, concerns, complaints, criticisms in the comment section. I'll see everybody next time. See ya!